So I'm here to present you today the secure coding guidelines for the Java programming language, and I'm a member of the Java vulnerability team, and we are the team to evangelize and present these guidelines. And we also work on vulnerabilities to have them fixed in updates. So this is something you may have seen. Study this thoroughly. It's very important. So, good. So this is the introduction for today. We go a little bit into details. Then we have the introduction. Then I'm going to show you a little bit of Java security, about the basics. Then we go into vulnerabilities itself, followed by the guidelines anti-patterns and examples, and we conclude with the summary. <coughs> so, who am I? I have a professional background in programming since 20 years. So, I joined the uh, Oracle Java vulnerability team in August 2010. Before that, I was with a major German data center and with Red Hat. Uh, did Java research, Java security research over a decade, so presented Black Hat and wrote a thesis at Uni Bamberg, and did numerous talks on Java security. Also did some other ethical hacking and found bugs in not only JIE, but only Windows kernel, OS X, Firefox, and others. So what you will be seeing today is uh, about the risk of insecure coding, how the secure coding guidelines and the under patterns will help you, to address and avoid anti-patterns and programming bugs, and thereby vulnerabilities. You may want to switch the perspectives to reduce the attack surface. We're going to try to give you help with that, an invitation to think like an attacker, to identify violations of the guidelines, and identify the weak spots in your own applications. So who's the target audience? That's probably a mix of a Java programmer, a security engineer, and a risk manager. So nowadays, everybody is everything. So welcome. So Java security. What is Java security? So it's once runtime security, which is the behavior enforced by the runtime. Uh, this enables an applications to run in a safely environment. We have the crypto APIs. PKI, authentication and policy secure communications, pluggable implementations of crypto providers, for example. We have tools like key tool, jar signer, and policy tool. But today we're gonna be concentrating on the first aspect, runtime security. So runtime security, what is that? That's the language security, that's implicit memory management, garbage collection, the very important, bytecode verification, security manager, access controller, JAS. This constrains what's allowed to run, and how it is allowed to run is constrained by fine granular policies. You want to have least privilege protection domains, secure defaults for untrusted codes like applets or Java Web Start applications, and this is normally enforced by code separation with class loaders. So in the graphic you see a class, and a class calls another class, and it calls into trusted code. The code is constrained by the security manager, and by comparing what is on the stack and what is allowed, the access to the resource is either granted or denied. So what can go wrong? The man with a strong handshake said, computer security is hard. The attacker only has to find one network floor, while the defender has to find fix in every floor. So the attacker has probably the easier game, while you have to defend, and that's the same in soccer. The one who scores the goal has the advantage and becomes famous. There's also a scientific definition of a vulnerability, a flaw or weakness that could be exploited to violate the system's security policy, like written down in the Internet Security Glossary, currently version 2. 
And what are the causes? It might be design, so faulty assumptions in the application architecture, maybe the implementation, insecure programming practices, what we call anti-pattern later, or in the composition and setup of applications. Often errors in configuration, for example. So what types of vulnerabilities can be distinct? They are one, the exploitable vulnerability, or there is a security weakness. The first one always has a direct impact. It allows an attacker to get more privileges than normally assigned by a policy, so you would have breaches in confidentiality, integrity, or availability. An example is for ex could be a buffer overflow, and that finally leads to an operating system takeover. So that is probably something you want to fix very fast. Or you have the security weaknesses, which is not directly exploitable, but can be used in conjunction with the exploitable vulnerability to uh, extend the impact of an attack. So make a small vulnerability a little bit bigger. For example, if you're not following the rule of least privileges. So you're not closing enough the gaps that are there and the attacker has more possibilities than you want him to have. So where are vulnerabilities listed? Where can you find information? So for example, at Mitre, at the public database, the CVE, Common Vulnerability Enumeration Database at Mitre, they list vulnerabilities and every vulnerability has an ID. Like CVE 2010-4476. Who remember what that was? Oh, we'll see later. I'll give you a hint. 8th of February 2011. No ring belling. Okay. Uh, there are references, vendor details, and detailed reports. But CVE does not give a score. So that's how it looks in the CVE database. And that's the description of CVE 2010-4476. And that was, if you may remember, the double bug. The double bug that, for example, could bring a Tomcat server to a halt. So, but CVE itself has no scores. CVE only lists the vulnerabilities. There's a standardized model for rating vulnerabilities by the first organization that designed CVSS standard. And the scores are listed in the NVD database. They have a CVSS calculator, and there you could look up the vulnerability scores. How do vulnerability scores are computed? So you would have metrics and scores. Metrics illustrate the nature of a vulnerability, which uh, split up in exploitability and impact. And the base score is a scaled value from 0 to 10. So you would have the vulnerability, exploitability, which is the access vector, which could be local or in an adjacent network, or on the network. So a network attack probably scores higher than a local attack. This is also with access complexity, which could be high, medium, or low. And a low access complexity scores higher than a high one. So probably a little bit complicated, but it is this way. Authentication, there could be multiple, single or none. So of course, the non-authentication vulnerability scores higher. There could be confidentiality impact, which could be non partial or partial plus or complete. And the complete one scores higher. Integrity, availability, similar. So how was the double bug scored? We see CVE 2010, 4476, I read it. Second column is the component, which was the Java runtime environment. What was the protocol? You could reach it via multiple protocols. Typical HTTP was the most severe one. The subcomponent was in the language packages and was a remote exploit possible without authentication. Yes. So the base score was five because it has a network access 
it was a net network access vulnerability with a low, with a low com access complexity and no authentication. And you would have no authentication, no confidentiality, no integrity, but a partial availability impact. So, and you will also be interested in the versions. So six update 23 and five update 27, for example, fixed the issue. So that's what you find in the corresponding Oracle security alert. So if you found that vulnerability, you would have written that to zekalert underscore us oracle.com or as a customer, you would have gone to support oracle.com. If you find other vulnerabilities, please read the detailed information in the listed URL. So, these are vulnerabilities in a nutshell. Let's get down to the guidelines. So, who is using guidelines in his organization? Security guidelines and are the developers following those guidelines? I don't hear much yes, so it could be or could be no. So you probably want to have another set of guidelines. An important thing is something that you have um, counter examples that you want to avoid. An anti-pattern, for example, is such a construct that allows you to avoid bad practices. So it may look beneficial in the first place, but it has bad consequences. It's a negative counterpart to a design pattern, but due to its illustrative value, it had an educational purpose. So implementing for speed could be good, but if you don't validate parameters, it could harm your security. So you have to weigh is what is more important. So anti-patterns are not set in stones. There may be exceptions. There may be priorities. But of course, you have to understand the consequences. They may exist in various locations. System code, application code, third-party libraries that you may have support, very important, or in JRE extensions. You can read up in this nice book about the theory of anti-patterns. So, anti-patterns. You may have heard about C and C++. C++ implementations, what can go wrong? Um, they enable memory exploits in both languages, like heap and buffer overflow because to native code. It runs directly on the processor. There is no sandbox or something. Uh, Java is different. Java uses safely memory management. It performs automatic bounce checks. It has no explicit pointer arithmetics. Java often executes untrusted code. Thereby, you have to protect the access to these resources. You probably don't have authorization to. So this results probably in a different set of coding anti-patterns and C. Well, it's still important to know about these anti-patterns once you program in JNI, because with JNI, you have all these C, C++ problems that you want to avoid with Java. So what can go wrong in Java code? There are common misconceptions that lead to a larger attack surface. So like neglecting to verify valid input formatting, giving unnecessary permissions, misusing public static variables, superclasses, if you change superclasses, they may have impact on your subclasses. You may assume that exceptions are harmless. Integers are sometimes very tricky to handle because of their behavior. Often you trust user input, but the user input, it does not obey to invariance. When you use construction, constructors, and the constructor fails, what is the expected behavior? There is some, something, the belief that it will be destroyed in all cases, believing that deserialization is unrelated to constructors. 
but deserializing is a hidden way to construct objects. So we have to know that. Where can you find out about the guidelines? You can find out at this web page. I guess these slides will be made available to, so you don't have to make notes. Um, these are the official guidelines now in generation four and they are evolving topic, so expect new versions coming up once there is a need for it. And there's also check uh, third party guidelines collections like the book and the wiki from CERT about secure coding. There is a C with WE also from the METO organization that shows bad examples and anti-patterns. If you're more into web applications, you may find the OVAS top 10 interesting or go to SANS and browse their top 25 software errors. But the guideline from the source will be our guidelines you, list, you see on the top. They are Java specific, whereas the others may be generic. So be sure to address the Java guidelines first. How do the guidelines split up? So first we have the fundamentals. Then there's a chapter about denial of service, confidential information. So the, this addresses the confidentiality impact. Then we go more into integrity, injection and inclusion, accessibility and extensibility. Input validation, very important. If you deal with objects, with object states, mutability is very interesting. The life cycle shown with object construction, serialization, and how you would constrain code is shown in chapter nine. Now we go through the guideline chapters, how the uh, guidelines address the top level concerns when you want to write secure code. For each of those, we show an example from an older JDK release, show the problem and the attack scenario with an anti-pattern, and we briefly describe the proper secure coding guidelines, and you have seen the URL, you can go into depth with the re referenced online documentation. So, the first, the fundamentals. Prefer to have no obvious flaws than, no, obviously no flaws rather than no obvious flaws. This is our meta rule. Design APIs to avoid security concern. You want to avoid duplication. You want to restrict privileges. Trust boundaries. Minimize the number of permission checks. Undo encapsulation. Why do you want to do that? Well, it's probably a hope, but security vulnerabilities will never be el eliminated. But you probably have it easier if you have well-designed and tested code. And least privilege by design prevents insecure surprises, even if the code itself is not written very secure. So this has obviously no flaw. But can you find out here? This is probably not too good to find out. So after three months of audit, you probably come to this picture. And you will not be sure at all. So you probably prefer that one. That one and compose your system out of obvious blocks that have obviously no flaws. Think about if you use generated code. Second, designed uh, APIs to avoid security concern. You probably want to get the security into the design. You cannot, or you can, but it's probably very uh, costly to retrofit security and it's error prone and difficult. So for example, make classes final as default, which will prevent a malicious club subclass from adding finalizers, perform cloning, overriding, calling protected methods, also, having to behave the subclass in a 
somehow unsafe manner. Attackers are very creative, so expect the unexpected. So, reuse, avoid duplication. You can't say it often enough. A key characteristic of a secure program is to maximize reuse because you don't have to maintain so much because other people do it for you. Like Oracle, they maintain standard libraries which you can reuse. Therefore, reuse is king, and the Duke, of course, must have a crown in this case. So, restrict privileges. Not all calling flaws will be limited even in well-reviewed code. Whenever possible, follow the principle of least privileges. Reduce privileges means reduce potential impact of exploits. You can do that either statically through policy files. May not be everybody's taste, so can, can do it also with dynamically with two privileges, with dynamic protection domains. You can also decide to leave jar files unsigned so they don't get elevated privileges from the beginning. That depends on your current situation, what you want to do and what technology you want to apply. Establish trust boundaries. You probably want to have simple APIs to clearly distinguish who can I trust and who is outside of my trust boundary. That's a simple meta rule that first pops up when you violated it. Minimize the number of mission checks. Prefer an easy point of, of access. This easiest consistent access policy. After an initial permission check, you probably want to provide clients with an immutable capability object or more. And you want to consider JAS to reuse a standard API. So you don't have to write that all by yourself, which probably has bugs. Encapsulate, you want to group current functionality. You do not want to expose implementation details and poke, let people poke in your public non-final fields. You want to have a simple and stable API which uh, documented behavior. You want to consider builders and factories to have abstraction, lifecycle control, and invariance checking. These are all not only goals for security, but for well-designed software at all. So this was the fundamental section. Now we come into security topics. Denial of service. How can you plan against denial of service? You probably want to do that in the design phase. You want to use strong parsers, prefer XML DTD over other serialization types. And overall, don't let the attackers bring down your server. So you want to be aware of activities that may use disappropriate resources. You want to release the resources in all cases. You don't want to, your memory to be filled up with zombie objects. Resource limit checks should not suffer from integer overflow. So all these are goals you want to have, you want to follow to avoid denial of service. What can cause disappropriate resource consumption? That can be either media stuff like large image processing, integer overflows, complex object graphs, careless decompression, zip bombs, for example, billion last attacks, as with XML external entity inclusion, parsing and processing complex grammars, XPars, regex, all these kind of very powerful languages, but with unpredictable parsing times. Deserialization anomalies, logging with inappropriate detail, and parsing corner cases that may cause infinite loops, like in the double case. So resource limit checks. What can go wrong? If you look at this example, what is the problem? You've been to my joke talk. No? <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's the integer overflow. And where is the integer overflow? 
Yes. And it can overflow. So this protection of the native method will be circumvented. Of plus length, it will be larger than the maximum value of integer and it will be negative. And therefore, this comparison will fail. So, the under pattern is believing the value space of integers is unbounded. Of course, it is bounded. So, what would you would do? The Java language provides bounds checking on arrays, which mitigates the vast majority of integer overflow attacks. However, the primitive types silently overflows, which are characters, bytes, longs, integers. So they allow potential bypass of Java level ability checks to native code. And once they are, once these checks are bypassed, you could cause memory corruption out of bounds writes and have probably your JVM crash. So you would look into your code if you want to pr protect your native code and replace this. So this is check, for example, that does the direct addition with a subtraction construct, which is the same, which has the same effect, but uses more space of the integer value range. So, resource limit checks. They can cause integer overflows, and what you have to take home is that this comparison is better than the direct comparison with plus. Okay. Now we've seen, we've seen how we protect the goal of availability. We look into confidentiality. Why do I want to do that? I don't want to let attackers steal my company secrets. A successful attack starts with acquiring small details about the target. Information gathering, is it called? configuration details, passwords, it all starts at a very low level, and the attacker do, does it like scavenger hunt, elevate the privileges step by step. So you want to purge sensitive information from exception. You don't want to lock sensitive information. You want to purge sensitive information from memory after use. So, you probably all use exceptions, exception in your daily Java programming, and you design your exception to write about the cause, what have gone wrong. But think about what the attacker may read from your exceptions. An IO exception, it may show the user identity. A file not found exception. You can probe the file system for specific usual suspects like Zetra Passvidi or Zetra Shadow or whatever, and to find out about your system details. So you want to think about verbose debugging. It's great, but not in production use. Consider separating output channel, reuse a decent logging framework. Probably gives the user only a hash of the things that got gone wrong and write the detail with a decent logging framework in a protected space for the first level support to pick up. Confidential information. It can also appear with passwords. You don't want to lock that. You need to have a security policy in place. Don't have passwords stored in clear text. Encrypt with standard APIs and when you hash, hash with salt. Consider purging highly sensitive information after reuse, which helps you to limit the exposure and memory. Delete it as soon as possible. Do not depend on garbage collection. It may stay in memory forever. Depending how large your memory is, the garbage collector may never run 
So use character arrays to clear the traces. This will be done immediately. Keep the information local. Once you gave it to a second API, it may have created copies, created strings from your car arrays. So think about audit the third party libraries if they also follow this goal. That was confidentiality. Inclusion and injection. So you want to have a clear distinction how to protect integrity. You want to validate data from untrusted sources. You have whitelists. Who of you uses blacklists to keep the attackers out? Good. Nobody uses blacklists. But I come looking at your code and we will see. So, use standard parsers. So these are all good advices. Now we come to the details. You want to generate valid formatting. You want to avoid dynamic SQL. Use prepared statements, for example. XML and HTML, it requires care. Think about cross-site scripting. Avoid untrusted data on the command line. Runtime get runtime exec can be harmful. Restrict XML inclusion, especially if it comes from untrusted sources. So think about the resolvers. Care with BMP files. They may have included color profiles that may probe your system. This is disable HTML display in swing components, which is the same question as with HTML generation on 3.3. And if you have an embedded script framework, that can be also very harmful. So if you neglect to verify valid input formatting, which is the anti-pattern of 3.1, generate valid input formatting. Um, you have an example for, from JDK 1.4. Who is still using JDK 1.4? Nobody good? Oh, good. <laughs> How long still? Oh, good. So there's uh, probably the opportunity to upgrade once. Um, but in JDK 1.4, you will find the HTTP URL connection, which uh, has a function set request property. And a common misconception is that this function does input formatting. But it did not. Of course, in the meantime, it does, but it did not. So the attacker could craft HTTP headers with custom value strings, and you would bypass security restrictions by writing some embedded HTTP requests that would bypass your security policy. So this would get added to a request and you would have a, a valid request to the original host, and you would have an invalid request that is added, and the proxy would then go double this request and go to the victim host, and would also, which is the security policy which it allows, would go to the applet origin host. So, Instead of obeying the same origin policy, you would have attacked a third party. Of course, this is fixed now. This will only work in the intranet because you may have not been whitelisted for this website. So expect to create uh, Expect creative inputs with out-of-bounds values or escape characters to circumvent all kinds of protections. Prefer whitelists. 
prefer whitelists. Blacklisting is useless against new attack types. It affects code that processes requests or delegates to subcomponents. So the attacker may construct around with network protocols. He may construct SQL requests that you didn't expect. It may call even into shell script with certain escape characters once the attacker founds an adequate way in your code, in your runtime, get runtime, for example. There are also additional issues when calling into native code, C and C++, because that has no additional, no automatic bound checking as Java has. So always double the uh, validation code. So generate valid formatting. What does it mean? To validate input. Again, prefer whitelist. Check for escape characters. Reject malforms, malformed requests early. Don't try to autofix some attacker controlled string. It may directly do, he may directly get what he wants. Reject and don't try to autofix. Regular expression APIs, it can help you to validate input strings. And that would give you a whitelist. Pass only validated inputs to subcomponents. Drop native methods. Reuse well tested libraries instead of ad hoc code. Reuse is very important. Reuse prevents you from inheriting vulnerabilities of your own code and never get it maintained or fixed. That was about integrity. Now we go into object construction and class models and extensibility and accessibility. Why would you do that? To uh, reduce the text surface, to assign the least accessibility required to your code, least privileges. That would prevent unwanted modifications of your code. You would limit the accessibility of classes, methods, interf interfaces, and fields. You would limit the accessibility of packages, isolate unrelated code, limit exposure of class loader instances, limit the extensibility of class and methods, understand, and you need to understand how a superclass can affect subclass behavior. What can go wrong? There's an example from JDK 102, who's still using that? Oh, not so many. So there was the hash table. And the hash table, it had a put, it has a put and a remove operation. And there are the properties. The properties extend the hash table. There's a provider that extends the properties. So the provider inherits put and remove from hash table and overrides them and does a security check. So far, so good. Now, hash table gets extended. It gets a new function with a new JDK release. Set entry set. So what could happen? The answer was that the entry would bypass the security checks that are enforced with put and remove and does directly and has a direct access to the raw entry set. Yes. And therefore you could modify the provider's internal state. So the attacker bypasses those and uses the inherited entry set to delete properties because the entry set supports the removal and that would violate the integrity. So subclasses, what do we learn from that? Subclasses cannot guarantee encapsulation. The superclass may modify behavior of methods that have not been overwritten. The superclass may add new methods. Security checks enforced in subclasses can therefore be bypassed, which we have seen with provider remove, because there is entry set that would bypass that. But 
that was fixed by avoiding inappropriate subclassing. You would subclass only when the inheritance model is well specified and well understood. When in doubt, use to avoid such, such cases, prefer composition instead of inheritance. <laughs> Monitor changes to superclasses otherwise. Identify behavior change, changes of existing inherited methods and override if necessary. Identify new methods and override if necessary. So, in this case, entry sets was overwritten and turned into an immutable set and the problem was gone. Five, validate inputs. Expect the unexpected, use whitelists, bogus input, matrix, instrument, harmless code into malicious behavior and work like a weird machine. This would prevent attackers from modifying the control flow. Validate inputs, validate outputs, define robbers. Validate inputs. This is what you will see at the border control, and that's what you have to do with untrusted input. Check and reject if necessary. This is an example from JDK 1.5, which uh, shows Java Lang Reflect proxy. And the Java Lang Reflect proxy class, it expected a list with interfaces. A list of interfaces, which it would generate dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, proxy class. And then it would feed into a native method define class zero, which you see at the top. What could go wrong? The API trusted that the attacker used less than 65,000 interfaces. If he used more than 65,535 non-public interfaces, the bytecode would be in such a state that the native method would crash. And to make things worse, proxy is serializable, so it would be low for a remote denial of service attack. So by handcrafting a serialized representation of this class, which consisting of a lot of non-public interference references, you could bring down a remote server who supports serialization. So don't expect users to read and obey the source code comments. That's what you have to do to write the checks. Check all violations of invariance. Ideally, use whitelists. So what was done re here was to add a comparison to this invariant explicitly, and if this was violated, an illegal argument exception was thrown, and the problem was gone. Six, mutability. You would prefer immutability. You would create copies of mutable output values, create copies of mutable and subclassable input classes, support copy functionality, and a lot of other things, because you want to rely on trustworthy objects in privileged code. You don't want to give attackers the chance to modify those on, your behalf, on their behalf. Those are your security trustworthy objects. You don't want someone else to mess around with those. So don't expose mutable statics, for example. You would write robbers. These robbers prevent these invariants from being changed. You would decouple the internal states from future changes to the input values. So if the attacker still has a reference to the input value, he can modify your internal values. Therefore, clone and add appropriate validation checks, for example. So this will decouple the internal value from the outside. An example from JDK 1.4.2 in XSLT. XSLT had an array, and in this array you could define functions. So this was public, public static. And what could be a possible attack? Yes you could override the table. 
So you could override the table of the global function table. You could override the values. And once trusted code, for example, does uh, an XLT function, performs XLT processing, it would use your code. You could gather information out of privileged areas. Think about scenarios with signed applets and unsigned applets, and you could export values from unsigned and privileged applets. So, override the table, and it's yours. So, sensitive state could be modified. You could replace functions. You could establish covered channels. Attacker was able to wiretap data or modify its processing behavior. Static variables are global across a Java runtime environment. Keep this in mind. Because you can attack different application domains like code loaded into different class loaders. And with these static variables, you could cross these borders. But it's highly context dependent what is possible. How would you protect against that? Make your classes final. Do not expose mutable statics. Reduce the scope of the non-final fields. Drop array access. Treat public statics primarily as constants. Consider using enum times. Enums are type safe, switchable, and implicitly static final. So you want to use those. Seven. You want to do object construction, but you want to do safe object construction. Stay in charge of the critical object instances that control your system. Do not let attackers control your classes, your instances. Avoid exposing constructors. The event against, if prevent the unauthorized construction of sensitive classes. Defend against partially initialized instances. You want to have them initialized fully. Prevent constructors from calling into methods that the attacker can be controlled, can control by overriding. Defend against cloning of non-final classes. There was the example again from JDK 102 with the class loader, and the class loader looks nice, does a security check and that edits. But what can go wrong here? We will see that now. The attacker overrides the finalized, finalized method of the class loader in his subclass. So he keeps a reference in the finalized method. And by that, he does not rely on a fully constructed object. He keeps it. He gets that object when he runs into garbage collection, and he can control the class loader, even untrusted code could do that in this case. So he could call into very important methods. So throwing an exception from a constructor does not prevent a partially initialized instance from being acquired. An attacker can override the finalized method to maintain the object. Constructor that calls into outside code would propagate the exception, you would leak this, and this would enable the same attack as if the constructor directly threw the exception. So what was done? You would declare the class as final if possible. If finalized, can be overridden, ensure partially initialized instances are unusable. How would you do that with an initialized flag? That was also the case with the class loader. The class loader got an initialized flag and only worked once the initialized flag was set, even though it may have, the attacker may have an, a partial initialized instance. Defense against uh, partially initialized instances of the class loader in JDK 6 and 7, you could run into, you could use a security check function that would be invoked 
before the superconstructor is called. This would work with JDK 6 and 7 or later, and you would have to use the target 1.6 for this to work. So. Thanks. So, two more to go. Civilization and deserialization. Avoid civilization for security sensitive classes. Guard data during civilization. Civilization is the same as object construction, keep that in mind. Duplicate, therefore, all security manager checks during civilization and deserialization. Understand security missions given to civilization and deserialization. Because deserialization from untrusted sources, it allows attackers to create unwanted instances of critical classes. Therefore, always expect side effects with serialization. Again, whenever possible, use XML, DTD when dealing with untrusted sources. Don't accept serialized object as a default. What can go wrong? Serialization is the same as object construction. Integers. It may have an invalid signum. An attacker could put that into an output stream, uh, input stream. So you would read that in an input stream and read a possible invalid big integer value. So the default civilization cannot automatically apply the same invariant and parameter checking as the constructor. An attacker can therefore create a malicious input stream with invalid field values. Therefore, double the validations. Create a custom read object that shares the same validation checking as the class constructors. Avoid the default deserialization because in order to limit the window of exposure for an attack to happen. Instead, maintain a valid, valid state by first validating and then assigning to an instant field. Otherwise, you would end up with corrupted instances. Understand how to apply X control. Understand how permissions are checked. Beware of callback methods. Safely invoke do privilege. Know how to restrict privileges. Wire do privilege. Be careful of caching results of potential operations. Understand to compare uh, to transfer context and understand how threat constructors transfer context. Why all this? Attackers prefer privileged context to execute their malicious actions. And if you prefer pre least privilege execution, you can do that with do privilege in this case. So you would also like to safely invoke standard APIs that bypass the security checks based on the immediate caller. There are a couple of rules on that. Um, that would apply if you write signed applets, for example, or JRE extensions. The same applies here. So, you want to know to restrict privileges to do privileges. Therefore, we have an example from JDK 6. There was a zone info bug, and the zone info bug, it deserialized. This was in a read object function, deserialized an attacker controlled instances with do privilege. But in this case, we don't have any constraints. So the object is deserialized with full permissions. So it was read into the instance and it was deserialized as a zone info object. But you don't need all permissions for that. You only would need package access to sun.star. Otherwise, you could all kinds of strange things like overriding zone info with a class load or whatever and do all kinds of attacks in this case. So we did to restrict the permission domain in protection domain in this case and edit an access control context. This was granting a fine granular 
permission set and was used to deserialize the object. So that was a refactored code. It used the least privilege call to do privilege and only the package access control permission was used in this case. So these were the nine chapters, the nine chapters of Java security, the nine chapters of the guidelines. Coming to the summary, we have different anti-patterns, we have guidelines, how you could address them. You, thanks. Um, you would follow the secure coding guidelines to reduce the vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are a concern to everybody. You can have breaches, and if you have breaches, you probably cannot roll back them, especially if they are information leaks. Validate your data. Don't try to autofix. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Practice reuse. Reuse code is updated by others. You save nerves and reduce your effort. And save money, of course. Verify the attack surface in order to switch perspectives. Start assessing new code first. Are the exposure points? Where can the attacker dock to? You have non-final fields, exposed native methods, static methods, loop-like functionality. That's what you would look into first. Check your validation mechanisms. Are there bypasses? Don't apply a blacklist. Use whitelist because blacklists are likely to be incomplete. Consider a textile test cases. Access denied can be a wonderful test result. If you have more questions, if you want to dive deeper into the topic, go to these URLs, Secure Coding Guidelines for the Java Language, as you see, saw today. Go more into the details with Java as e-security uh, overview, an overview about Java security at all. And you could also check the third Oracle Secure Coding Standard for Java. So, thank you very much for your attention. This concludes my talk. And now I guess we have a few minutes for questions. The question was if there are tools to find out about these the violations. Well, there are tools like FindBox and PMD, as you said. There are commercial tools out there. And um, you probably also want to try to code stuff yourself, which is sometimes very important to know your own code. But there are tools out there, commercial and open source. And they are also tagged with uh, the uh, as security, for example, in FindBox. FindBox has a co uh, category of exploitable issues. It's not complete, but it's a start. Yeah. Sorry. I uh, think the presentation is going to be made available, yes. It will be on the Java 1 side, yes. Yes, I know. Yep. Uh, that depends. If you... Um, know how to instrument the existing code, it doesn't. There have been uh, instances, at least as I know of, of that application servers accept uh, scripts, for example, from outside sources like rule bases or stuff like that but it does not necessarily have to be Java code. It can be any kind of 
uh, uh, language, any kind of Turing something. Yeah. 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 There is a list of permissions, at least in Java Docs. You can find those. Per class, per package, yes. Yes, you could write a script to compile them into one document. Should be, <laughs> sorry, should be an afternoon's work. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And see you next time. <laughs>